Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone, and welcome to Rogue Valley Community Television at Southern Oregon University. It's time for the Real Estate Show. I'm Pete Belcastro, a principal broker with John L. Scott. Hi, everybody, and I'm Joe Brett with John L. Scott of Ashland and Pete's real estate team <laughs> partner in Table Rock Real Estate Team. And school has started. I mean, the summer has come and gone. We are getting down to the business of the fall season. And, and just because it's fall doesn't mean things slow down, no, as you're no. going to find out tonight. Hey, in our first segment tonight, uh, we're going to have a Market Watch show. We'll hear what the latest statistics from the SOMLS are. And to tell you that fall coming up, things are still pretty robust all across the board in real estate. And on segment two tonight, it'll be very interesting, RESPA. It's the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. You're going to hear a lot more about it. It takes effect in November and will change the way every transaction with a loan is handled, giving the consumer, ah, the consumer, more information and better knowledge about lo the loan process. That's well, coming up in our second hour with the Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. And realtors have had been having to educate themselves and get ready for that so that we can help our clients through that process and know what they're going to face when November comes around. The Real Estate Show is also on KMED Radio, AM and FM, every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. We hope you'll join us then. So sit back. The Real Estate Show starts next here on RVTV. to you live from the Digital Media Center here at Southern Oregon University. It's Tuesday, September the 8th, and this program will be seen all throughout the month of September and into the start of October before we get together again here on television. Of course, we get together weekly on KMED Radio. You can hear us at 11 a.m. on Saturday mornings on AM 1440 and 106.5 FM. This Tuesday, September the 8th, I had the pleasure to drive back to the Rogue Valley from the Northern Oregon coast. So I drove down the coastline, along the North Umpqua River, in and out of little foothills of the Cascade Mountains. It just reminded me why so many people find Southern Oregon and the state of Oregon such a beautiful place to live. And I think in the trends in our market watch that we're going to see, and I look at our three-month snapshot last year compared to this year, and see what those trends and numbers are. Yeah, people are on their way. And not just coming from just California, they're coming from all over. We're going to kind of get a picture of that and talk about who's moving to the Southern Oregon area into the Rogue Valley. And we've got a great panel lined up for our Market Watch tonight. I'm glad that you've joined us. To start things out, Dan Maymar joins us from the John L. Scott office in Ashland. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. You've been on the program before. I have not. No, but we go back to Lithia Realty. We go back to Lithia Realty. When Jeff Rogers and you and Pete Belcaster and I were starting out, that's when Pete and I had first got our licenses. And the market immediately tanked. Exactly. It was perfect timing. timing. 2007, we got licensed, and just right off the cliff, it all went. But uh, through that process, it's been quite an education for us. And you're a, a veteran agent, so that was just 
you know, kind of par for the course working through those tough times. It was, it was an interesting time to be a realtor. Yeah. Um, and uh, thankfully, we had a savings account. <laughs> and it's about time you got out of the show then. If we haven't it's had about you time. before. It's about time. Welcome. Good to have yeah, you along, Dan. Thank you. Also with us is Guy Giles from Ditech Mortgage. And Guy, welcome back to the program. Thanks. You're a regular. It's good to be here. I've been here a little while field. now. Yeah. It kind of feels weird, but yeah, yeah I have. Yeah. So We are hoping for Brad Bennington to join us as well before the segment is out. He should be here in just a moment or two. But, Guy, let's talk first about uh, what's going on in your office a little bit. In that, That's where the process starts for folks, uh, unless they've well, got a pocket full of cash to walk into town with. I think the process starts with me trying to get out of town for a couple of days, because that's what <laughs> I did this weekend, and I must have got at least 18 leads. So I'm completely booked all week, which is really nice. But it's just... Um, it's busy. I mean, people are they're coming to town. I'm getting calls from all over the country, primarily California, right. but but there's a lot of people from from everywhere. So we are busy. Yeah, they're they're coming, and and I don't know that it's going to slow down any or let up any much as it typically would as we get towards the end of the fall season. And it seems yeah. like we're steaming along. Yes, last year at the same time we had the same thing. We just got busier and busier through the fall, and anyway, kept on going. How about you? It didn't uh, didn't slow down until maybe about mid December, and then. Holidays took over, and uh, thankfully that happened. Uh, but I've worked um, sometimes when it just kept going. You, you know, in the you know between Christmas and New Year was unbelievable mm. um, busy. Yeah. yeah. Well, people are people are finding their way here. The economy has improved enough to where people are starting to feel the confidence to be able to make that move. You know, sell their property and come to their dream home up here. Yeah. What's happening in Ashland, Dan? That's where you're on the front lines and uh, out there uh, slogging it out every day and. Uh, it's always a robust and uh, pretty interesting market in Ashland. Ashland kind of leads the, the market in the Rogue Valley in so many ways. You know, um, when the market improves in Ashland, it seems like the rest of the Rogue Valley kind of moves along. But uh, unbelievably enough, it's, um, I have never seen the, the, uh, the ratio between the active listings and the pending listings um, so tight. Um, basically, when I, when I last checked for Ashland, uh, the earlier part of this month, we had 95 homes in town active on the market. Mm. But we had 65 homes that were actually pending sale. Mm. So what does that tell you? It tells you that there's very little inventory available, um, especially in the lower price ranges. And um, I think it's something to note. Um, in, the, in the really bad times, like 2009, um, I was seeing ratios of 13 to 1, mm -hmm. where you had 13 mm -hmm. active listings to every pending right. sale. So now we're less than 2 to 1. It's, a, it's an incredible sellers that's, market. Yeah, that's a big, big turnaround. And uh, that activity, it reflects the lack of inventory throughout the Rogue Valley and throughout Southern Oregon. We're at about a two-month inventory, and, yep. and usually we're at 6. Yep. And, and really, for a healthy market, you want to see a ratio of about 5 to 1. Uh, five active listings for every pending right. sale. That's a that's a really ba a good balance between buyers and sellers. Brad Bennington has made his way oh. to the studios. Welcome to you, Brad, the yeah. CEO of the Home Builders Association and a member of the Jackson County Planning Commission. Man, look at all these smart people here. Wow, uh, that's what we like. It's amazing. Makes me look smart if I <laughs> hang out with uh, all of you. So, in our new home building uh, arena, yes, are we continuing the pace? And we we you talked to us months ago about the lack and the uh, need for subcontractors yes. in the new home building. Well, that yes. has come up in our commercial and uh, endeavors in Medford. The city of Medford has run into some Imagine that. subcontractor problems that, that yeah. you said were coming for a long ways away. So that, that's probably not going to go away. That's a problem that uh, we're going to face going forward and continue to have an impact on, on what we do and what we build. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, construction is one of those funny things that you can't uh, you can't really outsource that. You know, you can't call somebody in China or India and uh, you know and solve that problem. That you just you got to do it right right here right now. So that's going to continue to be an issue. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, you know competition is healthy, but when you have competition for such a limited resource, which is skilled labor. Uh, you know the best time to grow an apple tree is 10 years ago and if you don't if you if you didn't do one 10 years ago the next best time to plant an apple tree is today but um, we as we've talked about before we've got a deficit in our skilled labor force and it's not going to get fixed anytime soon we're looking at a problem that's not going to get better it's going to get worse the further we go down the timeline the worse it's going to get 
The good news uh, here for us is, is that because we have such a desirable location, we have a lot of skilled workers that live here, not because they want to make a lot of money, but just because they love their families mm -hmm. and they want to raise their families in a nice area. Yeah. So they're willing to make less money uh, to live here and, and work here just because they like the area. So we're, we're lucky that we have that. But yeah, you know, you go you go and look at the at the uh, new construction that we have going that our that our members are, are building, and you know, uh, eighty percent of the new home construction in the Rogue Valley is done by our members. So we're you know, I mean, our our guys are the guys that are out there doing that every day, and they're working really <laughs> really hard uh, to create stuff for Dan to sell and and uh, guy to finance. But uh, you know, we're doing the best that we can, and also keep in mind that we're seasonal. You know, I mean, here we are. Can you believe we're in September already? I can't believe yeah. it. So here we are in September. Football season. Ouch. Hello. Football season. <laughs> and, um, you know, we are seasonal. We haven't had much rain. But, uh, you know, the, as we move into the cooler weather, production goes down. The days get shorter. Uh, you, you can't be as productive with your people as you'd like to. So, you know, that all factors in. And where it all comes back, you know, to your, to your uh, viewers and listeners is, is right here. And I just, I just had this conversation with somebody the other day. They bought a lot in Jacksonville, and they'd owned this lot for a little while. And, and they said, you know, we've owned this lot for a while, and we were just thinking of maybe doing something with it. And I said, well, here, you know, here would be my suggestion. If you know you're going to do it, and if you can afford to do it, you will be well served if you act sooner rather than later. Because we're at a point in time where cost factors are going to just start pushing things up the further you go down the timeline. Interest rates at the Fed have stayed zero for, you know, everybody knows Janet Yellen. I mean, Guy may talk about yeah. that a little bit, but Guy has been giving everybody really, really good news for a long time. And it's probably going to be still mostly good, but, it, you know, things can't stay yeah, zero can. forever. No. Yeah. That's true, and we're eventually going to have to engage the younger generation. We've got family wage jobs that are kind of waiting in the wings in our building and construction industries. And we just don't have the kids getting engaged in school or getting the foundations laid by which they make their way into well, those trades. Well, I'll give you an example, and I'm not going to tell anybody how old you are how anybody, how, or how old I am, but we're, you, know, you and I are old. And but you know when when you and I were kids, we could go down down to the auto parts store and we could buy an alternator for twenty bucks, and go home and in in about an hour's time we'd have our alternator changed out and uh, you know we're ready to go again. Well, you go get your car worked on nowadays, and I, probably the minimum shop rate you're going to find anywhere is what maybe a hundred bucks an hour, yeah. you, you know something like that. And so that 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 type of thing is going to start happening to our skilled labor industry in construction. The the you know we've historically had low wages because we've had so many skilled people, right? You have a lot of you yeah. know supply and demand. If you have a lot of skilled people that are out there, well, then you don't have to pay very high wages to get them because there's another skilled guy just right over there that's yeah. willing to do the work. So we're seeing that swing around. So the you know the price of carpentry, the price of uh, you know of an electrician, of a plumber, of a drywall guy, of a concrete guy, uh, all those prices are going to start going up because they have to. Supply, just, the, supply and demand. That's, supply and demand. I can and, even understand economics. And as you said, uh, you know major. the city of Medford uh, just got some interesting information about the cost impacts to their projects uh, that made it on the front page of the newspaper. So uh, wow. Yeah, big big impacts. Before we go to the market watch, we held pretty steady with the interest rates. You're still they're, making I, people happy, as Brad said. <laughs> well, I, I don't think they're going up right away. But, I mean, the, the Fed actually has the equivalent to no bullets at all in their gun right now. And they really need a bullet in there. So if they raise it, you know, they might try it for a quarter point. So at least they have somewhere to go hmm. if, if things crash a little bit more. I mean, around here, things are, like I said, you know, they're looking great, you know, if you just, if you look at it. But as a... As a world economy, you know, we still have some struggles that we're dealing with yeah. with China. And Should just I be everybody. scared of that guy? Should I be scared of the world economy <laughs> when China falls off the cliff? It, oh. it bothers me a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, things will come and go. I mean, Bigger question beyond the real estate. Yeah, but. we only have 30 minutes as yeah. far as that goes. I am kind of curious, though, speaking to him in Ashland. Are you guys seeing any permits in Ashland or anything coming down the road for, for him to sell here? Because it sounds like he needs a few houses to sell. New, new homes. <laughs> Do and um, I think the the permits have been you know coming online, but in Ashland there's very little uh, available right. land right. and you know it's not um, mostly infill. There are lots of um, 
remodeling situations that are happening right now. People are buying homes, fixing them mm -hmm. up, putting them back on the market, which I think is really a great thing. Yeah. And um, it's 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 been fun to kind of see, you know, people you know taking on projects and taking that risk and feeling comfortable about it enough and having and, and being able to reward their be, um, their efforts yeah. in that way. You come out well ahead on that. Yep. If you're smart about what you get into, what you put into it, right. and the effect that's going to come at the other end of that, yeah, that, that can be a very uh, profitable exercise. And I think that you really want to deal with professionals who understand, you know, not only the market, but how much it would cost to do the fixes to make it into something um, better. And uh, because you don't want to throw money at, throw money at a problem, yeah. and uh, you need to be wise about it. Yeah, and it, it, people's preferences change pretty frequently and what they want and what they need and so you don't want to put too much in and the next people come in are just going to tear it up and yep. do it differently anyway so it, it, there's definitely a science to it. We've got to uh, make our way to our market watch so let's take a look at our uh, statistics. This is a three month snapshot from uh, the last three months of 2014 to these three months of 2015 and first off we're going to give a big plug to the Southern Oregon Tour of Homes Yes, coming up October 16th through the 18th and the 23rd through the 25th. Wahoo. Brad Bennington, could you tell us more about this fantastic opportunity for people to see you, new homes? You bet. Everybody knows what an open house is and this is an open house on steroids. This is a, <laughs> this is a scattered site tour. We've got uh, beautiful new homes at different price points. We've got the green, the semi-green, the ultra green. We've got uh, big houses, we've got affordable houses, we've got super, super custom. You'll never in your life be able to afford a house right. unless you make as much money as But I as could guy. look at it, I could walk yeah. through it and look yeah, at it. Yeah, maybe Guy could afford one, but you know, normal, <laughs> normal guys like us could never afford one. But uh, it's really, it's a builder-centric tour. It, it's, uh, it's, you know, meet the builder, meet the product, meet the sub, see the materials, look at the floor plan, and everything's digitized, it's on TV, it's it's in print, it's fantastic. Excellent. And that one you had on the slide, that looked like a pretty nice place in itself. Yeah, so yeah you, could, you could live there. I could, uh, yeah. I could do okay there, yeah. my, my little <laughs> observation room there, by the way there. Let's go to our uh, real estate show stats. This is the August Southern Oregon Multiple Listing Service stats for home sales. This is just for August last year to this year. Uh, days on the market have come down. Didn't get the pending sales for 2015, but I bet they're right up there, Brad. What? Well, tell us about the uh, home sales, uh, August stats, and we, we've seen a pretty, pretty similar trend to last year, except for the monthly supply. Those are the big numbers available per buyer, and the monthly supplies are way, way down. Right. So we've, we've talked about the fact before that, you know, of all homes, new homes, are, 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 they're a niche market, and, and they're the smallest part of the market, right? So you've got all the existing homes that are, are for sale. Uh, one realtor in Jacksonville t uh, has told me, he says, you know, he can always tell when it's springtime because all the for sale signs come out in Jacksonville, you know, and uh, you know, lots of people just want to see how much somebody will give for them. But anyway, there's a lot of competition for new houses. We've talked about how the price of new houses has really experienced a significant increase over the last uh, 12 months. Right. And again, it's because... You know, they're, these are brand new homes. We have people, uh, our main market is relocating, people retiring, relocating. They have money, they have cash, and they want what they want, and they can afford it. So they're working with builders, uh, you know, mostly in East Medford, of course. But, and then we've got a few super customs, you know, going as well. But you're going to see, uh, you're going to see new home prices continue, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to see new home prices continue to go up. I wish I could say that well, it was not true, but here, here's the news flash. The cost drivers, the cost drivers that are there are not right. going away. They're don't, going, they're going to become more prominent. Don't sit on the fence. Dan Maymar, list price versus sell price. Uh, it was pretty robust last year. Sellers were getting over 90% of their asking price over 95%. Now that, that just shows the market demands and yeah, uh, and, and sure, it's, yeah. it seems like a very slight difference, but it is it amounts to a great deal when, yeah. you, when you're looking at these statistics. Yeah, um, I have you know there are uh, it's been really interesting to watch sellers and buyers uh, and competing in that tournament. Um, it is really brutal out there. Yeah. Um, the sellers know that they have the uh, upper hand in this market, and the buyers, if they are not um, uh, judicious in their uh, decision making on what they want to offer, um, they can basically blow the deal. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's better to come, you know, make a reasonable offer rather than try to lowball yeah. it um, because usually you can work it out with the seller a little yeah. bit later because 
um, buying a home is not, you know, setting a price. It is, it is a negotiation, it's a process. Yeah. And um, you, it's a give and take between buyers and sellers. And um, it's really important to know that, you know, the sellers are human beings too. And um, they, they have desires and needs just as much as you do. And as understand a buyer the does. market dynamics. Don't go in and, you know, try to, try to lowball a seller's market. That's, that's not going to get you a favorable response. Right. But, and, but there are some situations where, yeah, you should mm -hmm. lowball it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's been on the market for a long time, if it needs repairs, mm -hmm. if it's obviously overpriced, um, I, I'm not bashful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I want to. I don't want to talk too much, but I want to point out something that a lot of people wouldn't think about, and it's kind of on the, on on what Dan was just talking about. If you look at the, the list versus sell, three and a half percent increase, right? Yeah. Okay, yep. so big deal, three and a half percent. Why is it a big deal? Here's why: it's because think think, home. think of well, think of a conventional product, and think about you know like the rule used to be ten percent. You know, if you could make ten percent on a product, you're doing pretty good. Let's pretend let's pretend that if you're going to have a sellable product, you're going to you're going to make ten percent. Uh, in the building world, that goes up and down. But if it were, that 3.5% on 10% would be a 35% increase mm -hmm. in yeah. profit. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. So really, um, uh, you know what Dan said is, is, is a move of that significance in this type of a market really is pretty meaningful, I yeah. think. Yeah. Good, to, good to note and good for buyers to know especially. June, July, and August, three-month snapshot, existing home sales in Jackson County. Days on the market about the same. We can see the move in the price by the supply and demand factor, up 6.9%, up a whopping 40% from 2010, but that's when we were down there at the bottom. But uh, again, those numbers just reflecting the consistent upward trend of the market? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, um, and you know the, the, the dynamics of the market are just totally different. Like I said, we had a you know 13 active listings for every pending sale. You know, there was plenty of inventory. Um, there is, um, you know, the price has dropped. Uh, we probably hit bottom about February of 2011, and um, you know it's been an uphill uh, climb ever since. Been definitely on the go. I, well, I just think it was kind of funny when you were talking about it. Something that struck me today when I sent out prequal letters on a couple of different people, they asked me for more than one prequal letter, so they're prepared to go up right. to the next one and not have to call me at seven o'clock at night, which I never mind. But sure. you know, but they're they're literally just ready to go as far as that. And another thing is I used to get a phone call at least every day from somebody saying, oh, I'm looking for a bargain. Oh, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. That's kind of gone at mm. this point. You know, yep. you just want to go in, get a really good real estate agent like Dan and, and just have him go in, make a good offer that's a reasonable one. I mean, there's no reason to not ask for some closing costs or something, but you got to go in and have somebody that's knowledgeable to you know, make that offer because I have seen a lot of people lose houses. And we're going to see hardly any foreclosures or short sales again reflected in our overall volume of sales, which tells us that most of the sales that are going on are between buyer and seller on a pretty straight up basis there. Yeah. Uh, and that's rural, a good thing. Yeah, it is. Rural property sales uh, bumping up a little bit. We know that there's a lot of demand uh, for rural properties in Oregon. In fact, I saw upstate today when I was reading the newspapers upstate, the timber belt of Northern California and up through Oregon, the rural uh, cities and some of the rural areas are getting retirees that are not wanting to move to Portland or Eugene or Ashland, gosh darn it, but they're looking for some of the smaller communities, they're looking to land in some of these places where that timber belt in Klamath Falls comes to mind, um, and places that are getting a little bit of a rebound by some movement and some people moving up to our area. So that's also going to uh, be a boost to the rural property sales as well as the demand for areas to grow wine and other agricultural endeavors. Jackson County, May, June, and July, closed track sanctions, there it is. 90% of our sales are normal sales, and it's just a huge turnaround from when we started this show, and that number was about 65% of the sales that were actually REOs and short sales. So we've got a pretty substantial, we've moved a lot of that inventory. Do we still have some of that shadow inventory? or? Like, it's like the dark matter in space, that foreclosed inventory that's still kind of lingering out there. We've got blighted homes issues, and we're trying to deal with in some of our other communities. So well, there's still some out there. How, how is that moving back, back into the market? You know, um, I have scratched my head on, on many a house. I mean, I, I can think of... <laughs> I ask of, everybody I can that I question. can think of four houses here in town that, um, that are, you know, basically, I don't understand why. Um, but 
There are some legal issues that uh, happened um, in the short sale process or in the foreclosure process that are, are probably a factor in it. Um, but the, you know, some of these places are just not being maintained. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really sad to see. Well, yeah. and that is the thing in the judicial foreclosure atmosphere that we're in. You know, we might be having new stuff hit. It could be just stuff lingering from a little while back, right, and now it's right. too late for them to come up with all six months of back mm -hmm. pay to get the house back, but it's still not legal for them to be able to yeah. get rid of it. And we so. had a pretty good backlog because of the judicial foreclosures and the rerouting that we took in the foreclosure process in Oregon. So uh, there's still some inventory that's out there, but when we're going to see it come onto the market, and that's, that's anybody's guess. And... For a while, we speculated that the banks were waiting for the market to come back, and that's happened, and still some of those are kind of lingering out there, so keep a sharp eye on those. If, if you are looking for a bargain, they're, they're hard to find, but probably can be done. Real Estate Show, of course, on uh, KMD AM 1440 and 106.7 FM. You can hear us every Saturday. Existing home sales, Josephine County, June, July, and August. They sold about 30 more. The days on the market are down pretty significantly. Their median price is up. That reflects pretty well what our whole Southern Oregon market has done. And that reflects some strength in Josephine County that I think has uh, shown a little bit of uh, momentum up there that we haven't tracked uh, so much. Josephine County sales, new construction, uh, six last year, six this year for that three-month period. Distressed sales, a few more up there this year, and rural sales are booming in Josephine County. All homes on the market for Josephine County, 596. That's down 18%. And again, their stats for normal sales versus short sales scenarios, pretty much the same. And don't forget the tour of homes, October 16th through the 18th, and 23rd to the 25th. If you'd like more information or you'd like to get involved, send inquiries, please, to Rebecca at HBAJC, that's the Home Builders Association of Jackson County, dot com, and uh, we'll get you all the information that you need. And if you want to see some spectacular homes, make your way out there. Absolutely. Fellas, we've got a few minutes left. Thoughts going forward, are we going to, Dan, I like what you said in the comparison you had to last year, that we saw a pretty robust market continue through the start of the school year and into the holiday season. It almost didn't shut down until Christmas. Do you see any reason that might not happen again this year? Um, it, it all kind of depends on the interest rate environment. If we, if we see interest rates spike um, a point or two, um, you know, that would definitely cool things off. And um, I'm hoping that that doesn't happen for um, the people that I'm working with. Um, who are still trying to find that home. Yeah. And guy, you just got to keep a handle on the interest rates. That's what Dan I'm, is saying. I, I'll keep them low. Uh, and yeah. and you, you know, you'll do the best you <laughs> yeah, can, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, know, they, you know, and the nice thing is, is even what you're going to speak to with RESPA and, and what's coming down the road with TRID and, and everything, I mean, we've built such a good base for these borrowers that are buying these days. You know, we're not out there doing these low-doc loans. We're not doing these no-document loans. So the investors are really comfortable with, with the loans that we're putting out there. So they're, you know, where are they going to put their money? They're going to, you know, gold's not doing all that well right now. You know, the the markets, everybody, I think everybody believes China. that they're a little bit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, they're Stock a little bit market. overinflated right now. So th I think there's going to be investments for a long time to come. As long as us lenders don't go get stupid again and start loan making poor loans, then I, I think we're going to have good rates for a while. I, I, I still I, do. I believe so. Folks should know. And if those rates start to bump, your buying power and uh, and rates, you know, home prices are moving up. So if you're considering, if, if you're in that kind of in the wheelhouse of maybe it's time for me to buy a home sooner than later. Yeah, and I did some math a while back, and if I'm a little bit off, I apologize, and you guys can come bail me out of the CFPB jail or something. <laughs> but even a quarter percent in, in rates, you know, you're looking at about 5% purchasing yeah. power on a $200,000 house. And that's why I work where I work, because we've got the best rates. Got to throw my old plug in, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but we're going to find out, because I'm working with you on that. Yeah, now. that's <laughs> true. And, and I'm going seriously... to come up with all those documents that you talked about. <laughs> <laughs> and it is so annoying. Uh, you know, to have these people. Why do you want to know that? I mean, it's none of your business. Yeah. Okay. But it's the process. If the business gets me a loan that will be sustainable and take me forward like it's supposed to, yeah. I'm all in. I'll if get I, you everything I'm, you need. If I wake you up getting a DNA sample off you in the middle of the night, just roll back and go <laughs> to bed. Just pull a normal, hair. So. Just pull a hair and be done with it. We'll <laughs> take care of that. And uh, you're going to build us some new homes here? Are we yeah. going to continue building? When does our new home building season kind of? Yeah, to wrap up. Yeah, you know, it around here it doesn't really wrap up. It slows down. You know, in the in the winter time, it really slows a lot up during this really crazy time called hunting season. Yeah. Hunting yeah. hunting <laughs> season has this amazing uh, uh, breaking effect on construction. But you know, uh, the thing about 
uh, where we're at is uh, 10 years from now, everybody's going to look back and say, why didn't we buy more property right. back when it was affordable? Yeah. You know, back when interest rates were, you know, I mean, a uh, guy's going to have customers come to me and it's like, doggone it, guy, why didn't you, why didn't you hit me over the head and make me buy that piece of property that we were looking at? And Dan, why didn't you, you know, um, w for those of us that have seen, you know, things pass, sometimes we think, oh, you know, the good old days. And I'll tell you, the, in terms of buying new homes, the good old days are right now. Yeah. They are right now. Yeah. Uh, the fantastic homes we're building and with the low interest rates that are available, we are in a magnet area. We're in an area where lots and lots of people want to live. They're coming, and what's going to happen? It's going to be supply and demand. Costs are going to go up. Uh, Medford is expanding its urban growth boundary. Central Point is expanding yeah. its urban growth boundary. Now is the time. If, yeah. if you, I always qualify it. If you can afford it. If you yeah. can afford it, now is the time to buy a beautiful new home. Can't tell you any more clearly or succinctly than that right there. And yeah. that's why we get together every month and every week on the radio on the Real Estate Show. Stay tuned. Thank you, Brad Bennington, Guy Giles, and Dan Maymar. Dan, come back again sometime. We have lots more to talk about. Okay. You, you, you've got lots more in your pocket there that you could, could have yeah, brought I to the table. Yeah, we could talk all day. Yeah, we could go for a long time here if we really put our minds to it. But Pete Belcastro is standing by with members from our Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. Our bar is up next. Stay tuned. The Real Estate Show continues here for the September edition right after this. And welcome back to the Real Estate Show here on RVTV. I'm Pete Belcastro, and thanks for being with us. You know, we get together with you once a month here on the cable channels and the internet to talk about issues facing real estate and consumers in Southern Oregon. And well, tonight in our se segment two, we've got a, a, a terrific issue that's coming up that is going to it's going to affect every loan transaction basically in America. Well, we've got three terrific guests to talk about that. Rick Harris is a well, it was a owner of Colwell Banker in Ashland. He's yep. the past president of the uh, Rogue Valley Association of Realtors and the Oregon Association of Realtors. He's an instructor. I'm <laughs> thrilled to have you here tonight because Thank how in the world did you get involved with this thing? Well, uh, because this new loan disclosure process begins on October 3rd, every realtor is thinking about this across the country. It'll affect all of our transactions, all of our consumers. So we've been educating ourselves for the last year and a half, all these rules have rolled out. And I got involved because I teach and because I work together with some great partners here to bring the issue from a perspective of the three partners in every transaction. Mm -hmm. the, the realtor, realtor the lender, lender and, 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 the, and, the, and the escrow, and the escrow officer. officer. Right. Yeah. And so each of us have a different part to play, but it takes all of us working together. And so we put this little program together to show how working together with your partners 
lead you to a more successful transaction. Well, Cindy Fox is here as well. Cindy's from Tycor Title. You've been right. on our shows before. Nice to see you. Thank the you. title company, obviously, escrow officers. You play right. a big role in uh, in mortgage lending. That's for sure. We do. We're we're the end result of everybody coming together from your lender to your real estate agent to buying a house, and we put all the pieces together at the end so that we can close successfully. Yeah, and of course you got to have a good mortgage lender to right. do all this thing. And Jim Palazzola from Mortgage Express. Coach is back in the house with us. <laughs> you were here for how are you? Spent Pete? four years in here every yeah. month. You know that, didn't you? Yeah, we spent some time together. Pete. We spent sure. time talking about mortgages and how how you do them. And now we have new rules that obviously I would I would assume of the the broker, the escrow officer, that the mortgage lender, with terms of the way this is changing, you have the biggest responsibility in this. Is that fair to say? I would say, first of all, our panel has worked tirelessly over the course of the last several months, and we've given some presentations and, um, and kind of taken the lead on, on knowing as much as we possibly can about the changes which are going to occur and affect the way uh, loans are closed and disclosed starting Saturday, October 3rd. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a good, good deal of the summer trying to get a handle on this. Uh, I would say that there's a reallocation of responsibility, particularly between right. Cindy and I, mm -hmm. the escrow officer and the lender. I would say that it's, uh, I would say the bulk of the changes affect how we disclose, how our systems have to be adjusted from a software perspective, and also how loans close at the end. So I'd say that the, mm -hmm. the I'd say there's a greater responsibility placed on us now uh, than there in, in the current system. Mm -hmm. And you know, along with that, though, I think because lenders and escrows have got a changing landscape, I think from the drafting of a real estate contract perspective, mm -hmm. that the realtor really needs to know that process inside and out mm -hmm. so that uh, buyers and sellers have a proper expectation of the process. Going right. into, going going into, into right. it, Absolutely. realistic sense of the time frames, and being able to adapt to changing circumstances so that everybody's aware throughout the process of what it truly takes to get mm -hmm. that loan closed. How, how did we get to where we are? I mean, what, what's prompted all these changes in the way consumers now, you have to report to consumers? I mean, what, how, did, how did we get here? Yeah, it's two <laughs> words. Great recession. Great rece the, great we recession. had the Great Recession. How, and how many things, I will say, in our shows over the last six years have, have related back, back to that Great Recession, hasn't it? I mean, it's yeah. remarkable. Okay. And, and realistically, uh, the Great Recession happened because many, many loans went south, they went belly up. Yeah. And because of that, through the entire financial system in ruins, and so along came Dodd-Frank, a bill passed out of the Senate and the House mm -hmm. uh, that was designed to reorient the way that banks disclosed and structured loans for consumers. Out of that came the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Right. And their job is to make sure that before a consumer owes, they know. And their motto is, no before, no before you owe. Oh, okay. And the whole purpose of it <laughs> yeah. is to have consumers be better educated about the lending process, the costs involved, how to shop, and have have the same loan that they thought they were getting at the beginning mm -hmm. be the loan that they get at the end. And this isn't just uh, mortgages we're talking about. I mean, actually, the whole consumer thing started with, I mean, it's for everything, it's right? For that everything. you do now is not just mortgages, right? Right. Consumer okay. Financial Protection Bureau is just that. It protects the consumer on any financial aspect, car loan, home loan, student loan, credit card debt. They are really, truly overseeing all loans that are given to consumers. That's a big, that's a, that's a huge, uh, what, commitment or huge responsibility, responsibility. I guess, to do in right. these changes. What's actually change, changing for, for this? I mean, or what is a consumer going to see when I come in Okay, Rick, we have, we have clients and we say, you know, we got to go get a loan. What are we going to, what do we tell them? What are we going to change? What well, changes in the whole thing? Well, some things have not changed. Okay. Find yourself a very good lender. Okay. Okay. What has changed is the way that loan gets disclosed. And I think Jim can talk about that a bit better because he's intimate with the various pieces about how it gets disclosed, what's on that form, and really what the changes are that okay. help a consumer understand it. Yeah, I, th I think that you, you asked what changed. Um, essentially, the 2010 directive from Frank Dodd pretty much the, was the precursor to what we're dealing with now. Okay. Now, without, without beating around the bush, Pete, 
there were people out there, if you can believe this, that may have not locked an interest rate that they told the client. There oh, okay. were people out there that may have dis may have disclosed an ARM product, may have told someone it was going to be a 30-year fixed, and when they got to closing two days before their house, it, wasn't. it may not have been. Okay. There, the one of the big things that's always been a problem in our industry is lack of a better term, junk fees. Junk fees. Junk okay. fees. Okay. Fees that sort of got tagged on. Now, there's a price of doing business. Right. We have to pay to get files underwritten. We have to make sure that, that documents are properly prepared. There's processing that's involved in these, in these loans. Mm -hmm. But essentially what's happened, what has changed, is that when you tell somebody something, what you told them has got to be darn accurate 30 days later. For us, not a real change in the way mm -hmm. we do business. I mean, it's kind of a common courtesy to tell somebody what it's going to cost. But we, there were people evidently out there that, that uh, sort of abused that privilege. And, and I think that now all lending institutions since 2010 and now to a greater extent coming up October 3rd this year are responsible for identifying what these folks are paying for 30 or 40 days in advance of when they're actually going to go to title. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. I mean, you can actually well, you, do that. You, right? you, yeah. okay. It's yeah. very yeah. easy to tell someone what it's, going to, what it's going to cost because you know what it's supposed to cost. So essentially now it's become mandated and regulated. And it can cost someone in the loan business a significant amount of money if they don't do it properly. Is this a regulation of the mortgage industry, Rick? I mean, is that oh, what we're sure. seeing out of this? It's a re-regulation. It's a re-regulation. Re okay. and, and I think Jim's point's really important. I've been in business for 26 years. What we're doing today was commonplace when I started in the business, but over time, we sort of deregulated okay, yeah. the amount of information necessary to obtain a loan. And frankly, the Great Recession happened because many people got loans who had no business right. getting loans. Mm -hmm. And so this re-regulation really returns it to a, a kind of borrowing that's responsible, that's understandable, and where people shouldn't get themselves in over their head. And you know, uh, for some they say, well, it's too difficult to get a loan, and for some it should it be. It probably should right. be. It, it probably I mean, should yeah, be, yeah. yeah. So in that regard, it's a re-regulation of it. Uh, but it's also a clarification, if you will. So a borrower comes to the table and they get what's called a loan estimate from Jim. Okay. And the value of that loan estimate is Jim lays out all the costs that are there, the, the expenses that they're going to have in borrowing, the long-term expense of borrowing that money, uh, the costs to obtain that loan. And then when they go to the closing table with Cindy, they're going to lay that side by side with what's called a closing Both disclosure. Things are so, okay. right. And those have to be very accurate and and essentially with very little tolerance between what we were showed at the beginning and what you're showed 30 to 45 days later mm -hmm. at your closing statement. So, and, and as Jim said, that's simple good courtesy. You know, that a consumer ought to go, know what they're paying for, and pay for what they're getting. And that's realistic. The escrow officers, how do, how do you roll into this? Well, timelines. Um, there's going to be some pieces that change in the way we do business. Right now, what happens is your lender prepares closing documents, and right. they send them to escrow. To you. We prepare the final closing figures. The lender reviews them, says, yes, they look good. And then we call and schedule the signing appointments. What's going to happen now is the CFPB has this no before you owe. And what's going to happen is the lenders are actually going to prepare the final closing disclosure statement. And there's two different formats of delivery for that. One, they can hand deliver, and then they sign that they've received it. And then it's a three-day review period. So they have that, that closing disclosure. So how, does it, how, how does that work? Tell me how yeah. that works again. Because so okay, that's changing a little bit. That's okay. changing a lot. That's probably the biggest change, especially from the escrow side. Okay. So the lender prepares the final closing figures. They give it to the borrower. The borrower signs an acknowledgment of receipt, and, and they have a three-day review period. Okay. They cannot consummate the loan or sign the closing documents until after that three-day review period has taken place. You have to wait three days. You have to wait. Now you're that's... all done, Pete. You're all done. You're, you're all done. You have to wait three days but before you, have you to sign wait. it. Is that right? right. Yeah, yeah you're all but done you and wait. you've given them their closing disclosure, which matches their LE. Right. And now we are providing them 
they have to wait three days before they consummation is basically the signing the of the signing. note and signing right. the final document. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's a review period only. This is not something that a consumer can say, oh, well, wait, I've changed my mind. If your terms and conditions of your loan estimate, which is an upfront document, match the terms and conditions of your closing right. disclosure, that's simply a review period before they sign. This is not a, oh, I've changed my I've mind changed, period. Okay, okay, all right. But on top of that review period, Lender to lender, it can be different. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says that if you do not hand deliver that document and have receipt, you have to do a mail out, which adds a three day mail period before the three day review period. So date sensitivity of signing documents is gonna be a little bit different than what we do right now. Right now we get the documents, everybody signs, you know, and mm -hmm. we go. Right. It's gonna be get the documents ahead of time, date sensitive documents, we wait the right. review period, and then we sign. So now most times realtors will, will tell clients and say, you know, you've got right. 30 days, right? I mean, 30 days to close, right. if That's a normal, normal loan. But it sounds like, uh, we're right here, it's gonna, it's gonna extend that, it's not gonna be 30 days. Is that, is that fair? Well, certainly, Pete, it's fair for the first couple of months while this is being worked out, okay. because I think there are new time frames, new systems that lenders and escrow right. have to get very clear on. Okay. To do a 30-day loan takes a lot of coordination okay. between yeah. the partners mm -hmm. and between the consumer and mm -hmm. the lender. Without the three days. Without without, the, without that, right. yeah. So, uh, and realistically, the challenge with it is it adds this review period that Cindy talks about, and many transactions are straight ahead, they stand by themselves. I'm going to buy a house, you're going to sell the house, and we set our time frames. But some are not so standalone. Some are, I'm gonna sell my house in California, I'm gonna buy my house in Oregon, okay. which Pete will help me uh -huh. with, and I have to tie those two transactions together. So what can happen, and what we anticipate mm -hmm. will have to be worked through, is that Cindy's counterpart in California, the escrow officer there, has got this waiting period. And then once that's consummated, then we have the loan that we're getting here. That's got its waiting period. So what we anticipate will happen is that for the first couple of months, it may take us an extra week or 10 days to coordinate all of the efforts between our, our various groups. I think yeah, after a couple of months when people get used to the system and have their uh, technology and their process in place fully, mm -hmm. I think things will, will begin to see things happen in a little bit quicker fashion. But as Jim points okay. out, when you're a borrower, you have to be very, very responsive to the lender asking you for information and getting it right. back to them right away. So. Uh, I think that there will be a couple of month period shaking out while we may extend escrows simply to accommodate people getting used to the system. Okay. I think after that, once we've gotten it under our belt, it's actually uh, giving better disclosure, better clarity, and may make it simpler for a borrower to move ahead. We're gonna get together in a year from now, or six months from <laughs> yeah. now, we're gonna six see how now. that's actually six months. coming, come, come yeah. six, six months, months and see if it's coming through. Right. Okay. You know, we analyzed our last 10 purchase transactions over the course of the last six or seven weeks. Ideal borrowers, very easy loans to underwrite, no difficulties with appraisals. People provide us with everything up front. For lack of a better term, they flew through underwriting. We needed a little bitty pay stub and a, you know, an insurance binder at the end. Mm -hmm. Those transactions would have fit into TRID, including the three days. Now we said six of the 10. The other four would not, one size did not fit all in terms of whether there were complications, whether there were complications on Rick's side, whether they were negotiating repairs, right. whether there was some concessions at the end which precipitated addendums. Because those all change. Whether they change we, all the time. you know, whether we had an issue, no matter how minor it was with the appraisal, mm -hmm. with a potential rebuttal or rewrite, all these different things. Um, whether the borrower happened to be in town and was able to expeditiously get us the last few things that we needed. So I think that we're going to end up 
looking at allowing a little bit more time to close transactions uh, just in preparation. I know that we feel we're well prepared. We've invested a lot of time and money and compliance and software reconfiguration, a lot of, a lot of training internally for our people. But to say that we're just going to knock everyone out in 30 days, it no. would not be realistic. Yeah. No, not going to happen. Makes sense. Yeah. Sure. On the other hand, not every transaction is going to have to take an extra two weeks. Right. So not, I think, not at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think in that regard, while it will take extra time, and certainly it'll take extra patience. Is this going to, I mean, I've, I've been reading stuff, you know, on the government websites, which is probably, <laughs> they're very optimistic of things. Yeah. Uh, they say this is going to reduce closing costs. This is going to have those kinds of effects. Is that going to be? I mean, I think one of the biggest complaints, I suppose, from consumers is, you know, the closing costs, you know, when you think about them, how high they get, what they are, and stuff like that. Is that going to affect any of this? You know, I don't, I, and you, you mentioned junk fees earlier, and I think for the most part, since the 2010 rules and regulations went into play, a lot of those fees were gone. Um, you see bundled fees now with, with people. You know, title and escrow fees are just one set fee. Um, we have national rate calculators that our lender partners can go in and get our rates from based on sales price. I don't see really that any fees, um, I, I don't see that there's going to be a change in the fee structures. No, so it's not going to, I think it's going to, I, I really that. think it's going to stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. only place I could see a reduction in fees is if a consumer is out shopping and they accurately see the difference between lender A, lender B, lender C, okay. then they can choose based on really accurate numbers. In the past, sometimes numbers were artificially deflated, right. and then they found out at the end that it actually cost them some more. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think under the new rules, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. consumer shopping will have a much better capability of shopping, both in terms of quality of the lender, mm -hmm. but also in terms of the Do you fees. think you're going to see more of that? Uh, uh, shopping by consumers for these mortgages and this information, do you think, because it's out there, or are people doing that now? I, I, I'm trying, uh, I don't really I, know. I, I've been shopped so hard for 19 years, Pete, I can't see that. So ever you changing. have a lot of people that yeah. come and shop you, and you get them the information, and you do that and go it's on. Been yeah. People okay. have, and for me, people the have been shopping, shopping us since 1996. Okay, yeah. all right. And, and for me, when I counsel a, a consumer about it, I'm counseling them on two pieces. Cost is one thing. Mm -hmm. Capability is another. So yes. when you shop, make sure that if you always shop for the lowest fee, sometimes you get the lowest service. People are worthy of their hire. And so hiring a good quality loan officer may not be the cheapest in the world, but it also makes for a smoother, okay. more direct And how do we find those great we have to mortgage guys costs. like you? I mean, Pete, Jim, Pete, how do we, we find that? We have to contain our costs in order to compete. And so does everybody else. We. Right. And and the notion that the CFPB says that this is going to save people money, essentially there are the cost of doing business for us just kind of went up mm -hmm. very significantly oh, so. yeah. in regard so I, I to our role in this thing and, mm -hmm. and the additional compliance that's required, and just just we have to self police on a you know on a daily basis would it be a rating thing to know who are the good lenders and who are the ones that don't comply with these new rules is, is that or do we need to know that well certainly you need to know and so a consumer going talking to a lender talking to an escrow officer talking to a realtor needs to be asked these questions how prepared are you for the changes that mm -hmm. CFPB requires how are your software systems? How are your time frames? Good questions, absolutely. And good, good uh, questions, in working yes. with an escrow officer, what have you done internally to be prepared for the privacy protections as well as right. the disclosures of information? When you're talking to a realtor, how well do you understand that? Because for me, uh, the ability to help a consumer plan through the next six or seven or eight mm -hmm. weeks is crucial. And if I don't know all the moving pieces, I can't do that. Right. So as a consumer, mm -hmm. they ought to be asking those questions. What do you know about TRID? Can you explain it to me? One of the great things that CFPB did, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there's a great website. Now, just, can I just give sure, you this absolutely. quickly? Yeah, yeah. So it's www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash know before you owe. Okay. 
Okay. And yeah. that site has good information about the process, about the timing. And one of the nice pieces that's there is about a 16-page PDF handout that walks you through what this is. As a consumer, we want them to be well informed mm -hmm. because working with a well informed consumer makes it easy for your makes job. It easier makes it, for your job easier. makes it easier yeah. and gets them to the end where they want to get to to make that purchase. Mm -hmm. So those tools are out there for them, and and within that, I think the CFPB has done a good job of making the disclosures easier to understand, easier to shop with, and frankly, to be in a position to ask the service providers realtors and escrow and uh, lenders, how well they know their job. Mm -hmm. And I think an informed consumer can shop in that fashion. I like that thing that you know, I want to ask you what you know if you know these things. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It's a, we're yeah. almost out of time here and I want to give you a chance to say, is there any downside to this? I mean, is, I think from listening to you three, this is obviously going to happen. You're being prepared for it. You're out teaching people to get it's ready for it. it. And it's coming. It's so, coming. Uh, I think, I think the hardest part for people is going to be at the end. You yeah. know, they've, everything's all done. They got exactly, they got, they got a closing disclosure that mirrors their good faith. They're completely happy with our services and they want to move into their home. And they have to mm -hmm. wait. And I think that's going to be one, that's going to be yeah. the hard part is like, Jim, can we get this waived? No, this right. is the regulation. This is there is there are no exceptions to this, and I and I think that's going to going to be part of the educational mm -hmm. process. And it's a certain reality, um, and and it's built for their protection. But I think essentially, I think for for from my perspective, as a guy who's been disclosing accurately for many many years, I do believe that we're functioning with the best most modern, most understandable, most informative, transparent documents we've ever had. Really? And I think that wow. ultimately that's a benefit to the consumer. Whether CFPB goes back and revisits this whole three-day thing mm -hmm. at the end, I'm not sure at some point in the future. I think that will be a little bit cumbersome. But overall, what we're doing benefits the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. No That's, question. It's good. It's, it's good to hear this. You know, I'm never one for to supporting more government regulations. Right. I mean, I'm just, I just, it just makes me crazy. In this area, though, it seemed like because so many million, so many people were hurt right. by so many fraudulent kinds of practices, True. and the Consumer Protection Bureau, I think, is probably is going to be a good thing. And yeah. so, I think this is a, a start in the mortgage world, and we'll see how how it works. Right. And I think yeah. people, again, you, you educate them, and, and you know that, and realtors. Escrow officers and mortgage people going into these transactions, we're going to have to let them know. You were so right about that, Rick. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I, I think the most important thing is understand you have a team mm -hmm. and to cooperate and collaborate, collaborate with your team. All right. We're out of time. Rick Harris, thank you. Cindy Fox, you. nice to see you. Always a pleasure to visit with Coach. Same here, That'll Pete. do it for the Real Estate Show here for the month of September. I'm Pete Belcastro. Thanks to our student crew here at SLU for their support of tonight's program. Have a great week and God bless.